Shortly after conducting my feature interview with Joan Van Houten, some legal rulings occurred which denied parole and or retrial to the five remaining men convicted in the Monfiles case. I'd like to thank citizen advocate Joan Treppa, whom I interviewed last show, for providing me with updates and legal statuses regarding this case and concerning those convicted and currently still in prison serving sentences. All five men reached their eligibility dates as of 2015, and each now has separate and recurring parole hearings. Parole hearings come up for each man individually periodically as well. They typically get denied. Mike Johnson, Joan's stepfather, did have a parole hearing recently, and it was denied. For all the parole hearings denied, the reason cited is that not enough time has been served, with no other explanation. As for appeals for a new trial, Keith Kutzka, for example, was recently denied at the circuit court level. A new appeal is currently pending in the Wisconsin Court of Appeals. We don't know when that will be decided. None of these five men has yet made it past the county level. Only Mike Piaskowski, one of the original six men convicted, has so far been exonerated. He is the only one who went all the way to the federal level with his appeals because it is an expensive process and Piaskowski was able to afford it. I'm very honored to once again welcome Joan Van Houten to the Ultimate Movies broadcast show. Hi Joan, thank you so much for joining me in this follow-up to our interview on the previous show. Hi Lorraine, how are you? Not too bad, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Appreciate being here again with you. Uh, now last show we concentrated in getting mostly just the facts, ma'am. And in this feature interview, we'll be looking more closely at the effects wrongful conviction has had on the personal lives of those unjustly incarcerated, their families, and the community. In a reminder to listeners, your stepfather, Joan, was one of six men wrongfully convicted in 1992 and then imprisoned in 1995 for the murder of fellow Wisconsin paper mill worker Tom Monfields. Only one man has since been paroled and exonerated. How has your stepfather, Mike Johnson, held up over these past two decades, Joan? I have to say, Lorraine, that he is just amazing. Uh, I know that it's definitely much harder than he lets on, and he struggles much more than he lets on, but we all seem to gather our strength from, from his strength. I just find myself admiring him more as each year passes. And has it been difficult in some ways to keep him motivated to think positively toward exoneration? Or as you say, like he seems to be the one who has the positive attitude about it. It's very hard to stay upbeat um, mm -hmm. and to keep going. And, and quite often I run into personal, emotional stumbling blocks where you just become so frustrated and so sad and feel so helpless that you don't know what to do next. You don't know which direction you're supposed to be turning anymore. And mm -hmm. from out here, when you realize, when you really feel that you have such a responsibility to the person who's suffering behind bars for something that they didn't do, yes. you tend to constantly feel the pain of failing. Uh, every day that passes, that, I think, is the strongest emotion that I find myself facing is a feeling that I'm failing him. I'm, I'm not seeing something that I need to see. I'm not reaching someone I'm, I, I need to reach to help him. That, I think, personally, just for myself, is the most difficult thing to balance every single day. But have there been moments where it has been difficult to uh, keep him motivated to thinking forward to that exoneration? I think that his faith quite often and most often is stronger than mine. I, I find myself drawing from his faith and, and his belief and his spiritual nature that this is happening for a reason and that reason will come to light. And when that reason comes to light, um, those prison doors will, will open right. for them, and he believes this intensely, although the waiting, I'm sure, is horrendous for him, uh, I think that he tends to more feed us the strength we're feeding him. So his strength has been uh, a bit of a surprise at times to you then, has it? It, it astounds me 
that you can take a man, turn his life upside down, erase everything that he's worked so hard for, strip him of his family, strip him of his life, his career, and this man still stands strong, does not for a minute believe that his, his God has forsaken him, mm -hmm. and remains steadfast that he is where he is for a purpose, that there's a purpose in the suffering, and he holds to that. And a lot of people would turn away from their faith, from their religious faith, when, when they endure something like this. And, and some people in the same situation would want to blame God rather than trust him through it. Exactly, yeah. because, you know, the quite common question is, why would, why would God allow this to happen to me? But our Mike, the way he feels is that God didn't do this to them, mm -hmm. that people did this to, to them. The darkness in them did this to mm -hmm. these men, and that God is standing beside him to help him through it, mm -hmm. and that God will direct this to a better cause, a better good. Well, it is wonderful that he's never lost hope along the way of his wrongful imprisonment. But then, in light that he has been imprisoned for over two decades, what, what do you think are some of the greatest challenges he's had to face behind bars? Has he had to make emotional adjustments? Uh, it was obviously a big change in his life to, you know, from being free in a home and then to living in prison. I, I think for, for Mike, the biggest hurdle, the, the most difficult adjustment would be feeling that he not had any control over these things that happened to him and there's so little he can do from where he is to fight against it. He can't openly speak out to the community, he can't openly give interviews, he can't openly and freely tell his side of what went down and what happened. He ha he's had no control over finances, he, he can't be out here for his family. He's always done for himself, not looking for handouts, not feeling sorry for himself and, and meeting every challenge head on in his life and for him to have something like this happen to him and have so little ability to reach out and to fight for himself I think is the most difficult thing. Right. He can't pick up a phone any time he wants to to contact someone about, you know, the legal issues or anything or Um no, I mean there are you you have to have permission for everything you do oh. when you're in prison. You can't just make a call because you feel like it. And you can't, you know, you have to schedule times for things like that. And it's, it's very difficult. And you, you can't, it's difficult to argue for yourself from behind bars. Your ability to, if when you're, when you're behind prison, they, they raise your voice to the point where if you don't have anyone out here fighting for you, if you don't have anyone on the outside to lend their voice you're up against the darkness that you'll you'll never win against. Right, and like this is where groups like the Voice of Innocence um, do battle outside of prison for wrongfully convicted persons. Then, yes, and yeah. that, and that's how we came up with the name for that page on mm -hmm. Facebook, the mm -hmm. Voice of Innocence, because that's what we need to do. We need to give our innocence a voice because they don't have their voice anymore. It's been taken from them. And then, now we touched on this briefly in the earlier question there, but what are the biggest changes, uh, if any, that you've witnessed over the years, like in his personality or his mindset because of being in prison? Like you, you mentioned, like he's stronger now, um, his, his faith has grown. Well, his faith has definitely grown stronger, and his relationship with, with God has grown very personal in ways that are immeasurable. And he was a man of faith before he went to prison and I want to make that very clear because there's so many people out there that when they hear about someone in prison who is faithful to God they call it prison religion right prison faith and and when they leave prison they don't have it anymore he had his faith before he went into prison before all of this happened so it's something that he carried with him and nurtured and it's grown tremendously and uh, again, I'll say that we quite often draw from his faith and, and his strength that he gets from God. In, in other ways, also, what's been real difficult is knowing how he lives those days of 
the investigation and the court hearings and and who said what and who, who did what and he relives it over and over and over again he plays it but you know and the same quite a Quite frankly, it's the same as what I do on my end. Is I go back to the details, back to the police reports, back to the transcripts, and read and reread. And what you know, what what did we miss? What is where's the key hidden? Mm -hmm. And it, it's very hard having to do that on a daily basis. It, it's a weight that we carry every single day. Yes, and and what we'd mentioned too in the uh, earlier interview was like after going over this and your stepfather's had the chance to go over all this again but you always come to the same final conclusion that his innocence is obvious his innocence is, is obvious and I, in the beginning what i had hoped and and i'm sure other family members of the other men feel the same way is when we start looking into this and we really start digging because clearly something went wrong you want to see absolute evidence that one of the other men did it, that one of the other men had to be involved. You, you want to, to see that evidence point to someone else because then you feel like you have hope to show people, listen, he just got pulled into this because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. That happens. He got pulled in, but he wasn't involved, and, and that's really what you, what you hope you'll find. That, that wasn't even the case. I mean, I, I couldn't see anything that pointed to any of the other men. It was... The foundation that you live on every day and take for granted, it, it crumbles right beneath your feet. And you feel like you're just standing on rubble and everything that you had taken for granted when it came to the justice system and the sense of feeling safe is gone. It's, right. it's just gone. Right. People you felt that you could trust, they, you know, they've been erased because they're not the people that, that you believe that they were. And... And unfortunately, you do have to follow with the way the system goes, and you can't bend anyone's hand to, you know, make like a, a magic act or, you know, a miracle happen. We just, it's just, you still have to wait and wait and see, you know, what will develop legally. Yes, yeah. and that, again, is a whole other layer of frustration. You're constantly putting your life in the, someone else's hand, and, and it's quite often people you don't know. And you have to trust that they're going to do what, what's right. And you're going to trust, you have to trust that they're going to fight for you and fight for the truth. And you're constantly having to put your trust out there and be hurt and disappointed and saddened and, and afraid. Yes. Um, and it's such a vicious cycle that you live. It, it's very hard to keep going. And, and quite often, that's why a lot of people end up fading out of the picture and they just accept the situation as it is for their loved ones because they, they don't know what else to do and it emotionally it is brutal it's brutal emotionally when you know the person didn't do this thing and yet there they are and everyone that you run into that should be able to help either turn away or tell you there's nothing left hang on to every little sunbeam of hope that you can and don't let go of it you know hang on to that hope there I, well and that's that's what you try to do you, yeah. you try to look at the things that are positive and, and you try to look at the progress that you have made that so many others can only dream of where you're at again and, and you know until you see them walk through those locked doors you just feel like you're failing on a basis. It's, mm -hmm. it's very, very difficult. We have established, Mike, his ability to communicate has been so restricted. Within that prison system, what do you think he feels have been the most negative or debilitating things about being in prison? Like we mentioned before that his life has had to change. Like, Is there anything that he just profoundly has not been able to adjust to or doesn't like within the prison? He's living every day to the best that he can. I think that for Mike, it is having constantly say goodbye. There are so many other factors, like food is huh. horrible, and uh, I'm not talking just the taste of the food, but nutritionally it, it's horrible. He's gone through periods where his gums were bleeding, wasn't getting enough nutrients, and there wasn't enough nutrients in the food. He's needed medication that we've had to fight for. That kind of just 
personal health is, is a constant battle there. It's like nobody cares. Nobody cares what these people are, are having to eat, and nobody cares what physical ailments that they're having to suffer. I think that mental state that people have out here concerning prisoners and how they should be treated, that's a huge battle out here. But they're like other people. Uh, they think that prisoners are treated like hotel guests, but they're not. Oh, by far they're not. And it's, yeah. it's interesting you say that because we, I've actually been following a show, uh, a program on on television that that was new this year called 60 Days In, and there were average everyday citizens who volunteered to go inside the jail system for 60 days undercover. So nobody knew that they were not actual prisoners. And every single one of them were just astounded. They were astounded at the conditions and shocked at the yeah. way prisoners uh, were treated. And this is just a jail system. We're not even talking the prison system. And the prison system is much, much worse than the jail systems are. And uh, there were a couple of these volunteers that in the beginning they interviewed before they went in saying how well, they feel that criminals are treated far too well in the, in the prison systems and, you know, they're getting fed and the roof over their head. They really learned quite a bit when they went in at how these people are treated. You know, you have varying degrees, even of those who are guilty, you have varying degrees of crimes. You have, you know, your violent offenders. However, you also have your nonviolent offenders. Uh, in both cases, these people come out. You know, they're, they're going to come back out into society. How they're treated for 10, 15, 20 years in prison is going to affect who they are when they come yeah. out. Are, are we really looking to rehabilitate people, or are we simply looking to hurt them for what they've done? And if we're looking to hurt them for what they've done, and then we're releasing them back out into society, we're creating more violence, more crime. You can't treat people like animals and then release them and expect them not to act like animals. Now, regarding visitation, have you been allowed to, to bring your stepfather things, maybe like vitamins and personal th things that he might need, soap Absolutely or clothes? Absolutely not. No? Absolutely oh. not. No. Uh, I think at one point we did order him a book, but we can't bring him a book. We have to order oh. it. We, it has to be mailed to them by a supplier, not, you know, by the retailer, not, not by us. We can't even send a photograph. If we want to send him a picture, it has to be paper printed, like off a copier at home. It can't be an actual photograph. Such problems yeah. with contraband oh. being snuck into the prison and... People get very creative about how to do that. Um, yeah. They find them in toothpaste. They, you know, they can find them with photographs. You can peel the paper apart and put things in. You can't send them stamps because, you know, now they have drugs where you can lick them. Uh -huh. Oh, um, so no, you can't send them stamps. Everything they get has to come from within the system. It's just because of the contraband issue that prison systems have. We're we're not allowed to send them anything. And when we go visit, we're not allowed. To, to bring anything at all in with us, not even paper money. We can't even bring in paper money. It has to be coins uh -huh. um, for the vending machines in the visiting area. And what's the purpose of not allowing paper money, you think? Uh, I'm not sure, other than maybe they feel like you can hide something in the paper money. Mm. I, I, I have absolutely no idea. Some of these rules seem real absurd to me. Um, the length of your shorts, the type of top you're wearing, absolutely no metal on you. If you go with an underwire bra, you will be forced to remove it or not visit. Uh, it, it's just, it's a whole host of rules that done by when, when we first had to go through it. Well, it sounds like the prison system has complete control over what prisoners and your stepfather would have access to or, or what he can be allowed to have, and, and the rules are followed very strictly then. Absolutely, yeah. uh, absolutely. I, I don't know, you know, I can't speak for every experience. But I'm sure everyone has different experiences um, and view those experiences differently. But 
for me it was just it was just a shock and I've had to run to a, a local retail store um, when trying to visit him on a couple of occasions I've had to I've had to go because my uh, attire apparently my my shorts were too short although they weren't short at all because I can't wear the, that type of clothing anymore yeah. but they um, my shorts were too short at one point and at another point I had an underwire bra on and I didn't realize that it, it didn't even occur to me to think about the, uh, a wire um, in my in my bra and so I, I would have to run around looking for a retail store so I could buy a new pair of pants or a new bra sounds almost as, as involved as preparing for a wedding you know to make yeah, sure you're wearing the right it's thing very hard it's, it's yeah. hard and once you learn the rules you just learn to stick with them and yeah. uh it becomes second nature but when you've never had to go through anything like that before there was one point where you know i had gone through it a handful of times already visiting him and, and knowing what to wear what not to wear uh, right down to what shoes to wear because some shoes have metal plating in them and then you don't have shoes you can't go in so as we were waiting to go in and visit with Mike, there was uh, another visitor there to see her son. She went through the whole search process, and the buzzer, the metal detector buzzer kept going off on her, and she was handed a brown paper bag and told that if she wanted to see her son, she'd have to remove her bra. Um, and she was trying to explain something to them, and they just didn't want to hear it. They just said, hey either remove your bra or you're not seeing your son. And she had come from very far. She went into the restroom and came out a few minutes later um, in tears and handed him the bag, the, the guard. And the guard looked at her and said, well, this is really heavy for a bra. And he opened it up. And here it turned out that she had had breast cancer and the breast removed. So. Oh, so she had like a... Prosthesis, did yes. she? Yeah. And there it was in the bag, and there she was with with one breast under, you know, and, yeah. and her shirt, and just in tears. I couldn't help but cry for her myself. It was yeah. so sad, and but that's what you go through when you need to see someone you love. Yeah, rules often don't have sensitivity to them. No, not at all. You continuously go through the humiliation, assumption that you may be the type of person that's sneaking something into prison and you may be the type of person that's going to break the law. And here this woman was, all she wanted to do was see her son and she had to go through something like that that they wouldn't even yes. listen to what she was trying to tell them. And she had to walk out in front of everybody. Has that protocol changed since then to allow for more privacy and respect to people who have? No, absolutely no. not. It's just one big open lobby area, and everything you say and anything you try to explain is heard by everyone in the room. Now and then, personally for you, has your stepfather had like the same support from friends and family over the years? Has this lessened, or have you found that it's increased because people become more aware of his situation? It's increased, um, and it, it's increased by leaps and bounds. And I, I think that initially, what you have to get past is people who know you, who are afraid that other people will associate you with the crime. It, even if you know that the person's innocent, that you know you're you were close to that person, and you're so afraid of the stigma that, you know, a lot of people will take a step back from that. You know, you're talking about average everyday people who are just trying to pay their bills and take care of their family. They're not, you know, in and out of the criminal system. They have no clue. And so when all of a sudden they're somehow connected to something so horrendous as a murder, it takes them back and it scares them. Does your stepfather feel that any facts, apart from what we've discussed with the rope used in the murder and also the time frame doesn't fit for what the prosecution suggested, like, does Mike feel that there have been any other facts overlooked about the case? And how specifically has he felt that the justice system has failed him? I think that there are so many details about this case that are astounding and I think that the problem is that as astounding as details are and this information is, most of it was available at that time. And just ignored then? It either ignored yeah. or 
disallowed in court. And that's what you fight, because in the appellate process, you reach a point where you have to show something new, something mm -hmm. unavailable that nobody had a chance to use. You right. can't use what was available and they decided not to use it or it wasn't allowed in court. Right, you can't resubmit that exactly. old evidence. Exactly, and, and that's yeah. what's so frustrating is that there was all of this truth. Most of it was all there during the trial and before the trial, but the prosecutor decided they were irrelevant or the judge decided not to allow certain pieces of very important information into the courtroom, like the fact that David Weiner, who testified against my dad and his boss, uh, Dale Baskin, and David Weiner has said six months after the day of Tom Monfile that he suddenly had this memory recall of seeing Baskin and Johnson walking as if they were carrying something heavy. And that was the gist of his entire testimony. He claimed not to see what they were carrying. He didn't know why he couldn't remember it until six months later. Could clearly, it wasn't anything very traumatic what he saw. Two men walking, carrying something heavy in a factory. It says that's a daily experience. But that was the gist of his case. However, a lot of the defense attorneys strongly suspected that David Weiner himself may have had something to do with Monfile's death. However, the jury was not allowed to see the character of this man in full because they weren't allowed to know that at the time he testified he had murdered his own brother. They weren't allowed to know that. They were just allowed to know that he was incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And at that point, in a minimum security facility. And that's all they were allowed to know, but they weren't allowed to know that this man clearly was capable of killing someone because there he was in prison for killing someone. And, and those kind of things just astounded us. Like, how do you justify keeping that from the jury? And mm -hmm. then in closing statement, telling the jury that this witness was incapable of such a crime when the prosecutor knew full well he was absolutely capable of it because they convicted him of it. How do you fight that mentality? And that's the hardest thing is really so much of the path to the freedom for the remaining five men in prison rests in the hands of people who already scorned them and sacrificed them for their own benefit and ignored all of the signs that show they didn't do that. This brings us to the end of part one of the feature interview with Joan Van Houten of the Voice of Innocence Group. Please join us next month for the conclusion of the interview with Joan on Podcast 5 of the Ultimate Movies Broadcast Show.